Um, I think we're going to get started. Um, oops. <laughs> okay, good for the people on chat. Um, yeah, so let's get started. I'm sure people will trickle in slowly over the next uh, 10 minutes, but we'll, let's get started. Um, so I think last time we left off, we were just talking about packages um, and I was wanting to do a demonstration of creating a package. Um, so yeah, let's jump into that, I guess. Uh, so actually what I'm going to do, um, okay. Yeah. So like, it's just an outline of what we kind of try and get through today. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about some software engineering things, um, which are related to making packages and sort of how to test your code, uh, what it's like to develop an open source package and yeah, like just kind of best practices for for developing packages in general. So they don't have to be open source ones, but they can be like your own packages if you end up in say scientific software development and you'd like to generate, like do you maintain some code, which is more than just a small project. So I'm gonna go through a few things there and you might notice that uh, there is an update to the notes. So if you've read through the notes for this lecture, um, I have updated them a little bit. So I've got a section here on package tests. Um, so you might just need to refresh that page if you have, if you don't see that. Uh, so yeah, we'll talk a little bit about package development life cycle um, and uh, yeah, there'll be, and just a bit of more about optimizing Julia code. Now there's some other stuff about um, Monte Carlo further down, which we might not get to. <clears throat> um, and we'll have like make some space for talking about the project which I imagine is why some of the faces I haven't seen before might be here. So um, um, we'll just have kind of like a group discussion about the project maybe. And like, if I can help people with things, then that's great. Um, and then we'll get into the next unit after that in the second lecture, maybe. Okay, so let's get going. Okay, so a package, like creating a package, a demo for that. So let's go and do that. So oh, for this one, I think, I'll just get a couple of, so, so like you might see, my setup is a bit unorthodox, um, but I hope it's understandable. Uh, what I'm going to have here is um, a view of the file system. So which files are on disk on the left-hand side, I'm gonna look inside those files with a text editor. And on the right-hand side, we've got our Julia REPL. Uh, now you might like to do this in VS Code instead. Um, that will give you fancy GUI stuff, but I just happen to be comfy in this environment. So I'm going to do it the way that makes me comfy. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, VS Code is great. Use that if you like it. Um, okay, so um, I think I mentioned package templates before. So let's let's use that package. We'll, we'll just quit that stuff. So, so this package PKG templates um, is really useful for making, like just scaffolding your project. Uh, so it provides something called a template. Um, so what this does is uh, you can have a bunch of different plugins. So, so like basically it's a template for scaffolding the files for your project. Um, and the most minimal thing is pretty much to have something like this. So you just say what the username is maybe on GitHub. Yes, question. What's, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Need that to go away. Sorry about that. Is that what you're after? Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. I'm looking at a different screen, so I didn't even see that yet. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, the most minimal sort of template is just maybe a username. Um, in fact, this might even work. Uh, it doesn't. Okay, so you, like it's it's mainly talking about. Um, let's go back to the previous one. So it's mainly talking about like it'll make a Git repository and it'll make a place to put that code. Uh, so by default, it uses GitHub. Um, so that's what the user here would be. That's my username on GitHub. And yeah, you can add extra things um, to the scaffolding. Um, and one of the things which is really useful is um, some online testing. So testing which will run. Uh, like on GitHub servers, not on your own machine. So that's what this plugin thing is about here. You don't have to use that, but you can use it. I would use that typically 
if I'm making an open source package. Okay, so this will make this just like right, this is just showing you a bunch of the configuration that this this template has in it. Let's not worry too much about all that all that stuff. Um, but we can what we can do is we can use the template to make a new package. Um, so we call it cool package. It's not going to be a cool package. We're going to call it cool package. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I didn't run this before, so it's a little bit slow. Uh, but it's it's making some stuff, um, and what it's going to do is it's going to put uh, the package code, the generated package, into the dev directory by default. Now you can set it up to to like use a different directory if you want to. If you just have your code somewhere you like, you can tell to put it there. Um, but just by default, it's kind of geared. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. It's geared towards um, making packages which you're going to like develop and put on GitHub. So that's like where it puts it. Um, so let's go in, go into a cool package, not color types. Um, so okay, I think we might have we've seen one of these last time, but this is like the minimal, almost the minimal stuff you could have in there. Um, in fact, you don't need the manifest. So this is just a directory tree showing what's in the package by default. Um, usually there'll be a license. It doesn't matter if it's your own thing, but if you're sharing your code with people, it's always a good idea to have some kind of license to say what they can do with the code. And by default, the MIT license is used, which is basically just do what you want with the code, but just um, make sure that you um, keep like the keep the license on it, basically. <laughs> the attribution. It's more or less an attribution license with a few other clauses. Um, so yeah, there's a whole world of software licenses um, that you could choose to use, but that's one of the simpler ones. Um, so the manifest file, we can have a look in there. Uh, oh, there's not really much going on in this one. So this is just pinning down the very precise version of any packages which your package depends on. Um, so if you wanted to have your manifest, um, if you wanted to have the package be really reproducible um, and like in three years' time, you can go back and use that manifest and it'll go, okay, I used exactly Julia version 1.10.5 and exactly um, all of these different dependencies that they're exact versions. Um, whereas if we look in the project file, this one is more just information about like so, so it'll have compatibility information, which says that it must be at least Julia one point six point seven, um, which is the sort of long term support version, which is why that version's chosen. Um, but it doesn't. But it says it's sort of saying here that it could be anything which is greater than that. So it doesn't pin down precise versions, and sometimes those precise versions happen to matter, and so you might want to keep the manifest. Anyway, so. Uh, but the minimal thing that you want to put in your package, um, if other people want to use it, is your project toml, and that will have any dependencies as well inside of it. Um, so if we wanted to add a, a dependency, we could do it this way. So we could start a new Julia version and go sort of add static arrays. Let's just say we wanted to use static arrays in our package. Um, this is probably the easiest way to get, if we now look at the project.toml, um, we can see that static arrays is in here. Um, so it's probably like the easiest way to get a version of some package. And especially to get this stupid UUID that comes with it, which is the unique ID for the package. Otherwise, you're going to need to like go and look that up and put it in by hand, which you probably don't want to do. Um, and you might want to add like a version of static arrays, if I remember what it is, like into this section. Uh, I'm probably going <laughs> to haven't done this for a while, so I'll probably get the the um the syntax wrong. But there's like some syntax to say that it's at least version one. Anyway, let's not do that because I'll probably get it wrong. Anyway, okay. So there's also a readme. Um, there's not much in here at the moment. Uh, this package templates has added this build status thing, which is because I added this um the sort of CI plugin before um to do online testing, but you don't need to do that. Um, basically, you just should write what your package does here. And for small packages, I would suggest just write any documentation in the readme. That's fine. Um, so what else have we got in here? Okay, so that's like scaffolding stuff to make your um, your project kind of usable. 
um, your package usable. So that one's required for the version um, that Julia's um, package PKG uh, library, which will let you download packages and stuff like that. Um, these ones are kind of required for human reasons. Um, this one's required because it's the actual package code. So let's look in there. Um, there's not going to be much in here. Okay, so that's all it needs to be. It's the minimal thing that could be in your uh, your source directory is a file with the name of the package and uh, you would have any code in here. So like we've got some global constant. Um, you can put some function in here. So the canonical hello message is hello world, of course, with an exclamation mark. <laughs> okay, so let's see. That's not very interesting, but let's say we had some package code that did that. Um, so that that can be in our package. And okay, so how would you go about developing this package? In fact, let's like have a little look at that. Um, so I'm just going to comment this out for now. Okay, so in um, in my REPL over here, we can go dev. I hope this doesn't, I'm just going to start a new REPL actually because I don't want to interfere with the rest of, um, I, I don't want to have what happened last time, which was Julia to recompile everything for like the rest of the lecture. So let's not do that. Um, so we're just going to start um, a new environment and we'll dev our package. So this says to Julia, I'll just like add cool package as a development version. So it's a version we're going to like be developing and it knows to look in the directory where the default value, the default location for this is. Um, you can sort of give it an actual path, but so now if we go using cool package, um, we can, oh, 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 sorry. I would like to start that again. One one thing before you do all that is if you want the package development experience to be really nice, um, you might want to go, sorry, I'll make that a bit bigger. So you might want to use revise. Um, now, I think VS Code takes care of a lot of that for you. So it'll like use revise for you automatically. So you don't need to do that. But basically what revise does is it looks at your package code. And if you ever change it and save it, then it, fixes your package in the Julia REPL to like have that current version. So that's really nice. So let's now go using full package. I should have called it stupid package. <laughs> Boring package. Okay. Um, so now we could go full package dot X. Okay. That's one. That's great. Um, now uh, cool package dot hello, the hello message. Now, of course, that's not going to do anything um, because that's not even defined. It's just commented out over here. Um, but if I was to go and write this function, um, then, yeah, I can experiment with it over here. And it says, hello, world. so that's really nice. Um, so there's a lot of fancy stuff going along around like behind the scenes, actually, with revise, looking at your package code and looking at all the files. And if any of them change, then like goes and incrementally updates the bits that have changed. Um, so say if we wanted to have an argument here, which is who equals, and by default, it's world. Um, but we can do that instead. Um, so we can go hello message. Well, oops, no. OK, great. I've, I've done a mistake, which is great. Yeah, exactly. So does anyone, you know why that happened? Do you want to explain it? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. No, not quite actually. So um, in Julia, exclamation mark can be like part of a variable name. Um, so that's what's happened. So you can see that it's actually colored here and it thinks it's part of the, so anyway, but like we've got an error message, um, but we can go here. So okay, now it works. Um, and we can go uh, put our own name in there. And yeah, we'll get something else back. Okay, so that's like probably enough um, of the functionality. 
<laughs> we don't need to like go into into like detail here, but um, what would be nice was to see how to do tests. So if I look in the test directory, so if you remember what's going on here, we have this directory structure where there's a test slash run tests. Um, and inside of that, whoops, inside of that, we'll look in there. Um, this is where we have our tests. So by default, package templates uses the test standard library. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about tests in a minute, but um, just to give you an example of a test we might write. Um, so what we want to do is check that, say, like x is one. So let's go over to our over to our little repo over here. So if we want to run the tests for a cool package, we can type um, this character. <laughs> to get into test mode or into package mode, sorry. And then we can go test and then cool package. And it will basically run the tests in this file here. So you can put whatever you want in here, um, but this just happens to be using the standard library test. Um, and because we've said that our package depends on static arrays, it's also compiling that, which is, <laughs> okay, that's actually hilarious. That's actually great. <laughs> so it's good that I made a mistake here. I didn't even do it on purpose, but it's good. Okay, so what have I done wrong? <laughs> Come on, tell me. No, I did. I, no, that's fine. The syntax is fine. So if we go over here and look at the error that it's got, it says expression was x equals one, and then under fire error, x not defined. So why isn't x defined? Okay, silence. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, it's X. It should be cool package X. Okay, so the reason was I didn't export X. So if I'd gone export X, then that would have brought X from cool package into this namespace. But um, because I didn't do that, it's actually inside the package. I'm not gonna not gonna have that there because I like this like this. Um, you wouldn't normally export a name which is so short like X because you anyone who uses your package will get it and um, they might not like X in their global namespace. So it's probably not a good idea. Okay, so that didn't work. So let's try it again um, and hopefully it will work now. Okay, great. So one nice thing about the test standard library is it gives you a summary when the tests pass. It also gives a summary when the tests fail. So let's uh, like make another test. So we're going to go... The hello message um, is hello world. Oh, so I don't have enough space there. Um, okay, so let's try that. We'll run the tests again. Okay, that's fine. Um, so they passed. Um, but if I was to sort of have have this, for instance. I expected hello instead, then running the tests would give one error and it will sort of, it will give you a summary here that there was one thing which passed and one thing which failed. And further up, there's the um, like details about what the error was. So the test, one nice thing the test, um, the at test macro does is um, it will show you the expression that was typed, which is this thing here. And it also shows you the values on each side of that if it's a relational like operator, for instance. Uh, if it's if it's a, like checking whether they're equal, it'll show you that the on the left hand side was hello world and the right hand side was hello. Um, and that's like really useful if you you like want some kind of visibility into what actually happened when the test failed. So I would suggest like that's generally a, like a good reason to use at test over something like at assert. Okay, so we go back to our previous example and um, we'll do add one more final test. Um, um, some guy's name. Okay, um, so another way, uh, by the way, another way that you might like to test your code is you're always able to just include this run test file. Um, and that can be faster if there's some pre-compilation or something that has to happen or loading packages. It can be faster just to include the run test file directly. Uh, so let's try that as an example. 
Uh, I think I'm I'm in the wrong directory here. Where am I? Oh no, I'm in there. Okay, that's good. So we can just go include slash test slash run tests. Um, and so this will be much faster. You can see that's so fast. Um, and so that's like what I would typically do if I'm like in the middle of developing a package. I would just include the particular test file that I'm interested in. Um, and you might even split your tests up into multiple different files in the test directory so that you can do that. Um, there are more, there's some like more um, advanced testing frameworks which let you group things and rerun them and do fancier stuff. Um, but you, the base, like the standard library test is pretty good. Um, but yeah, you can always go and look at something um, more advanced. I think there's some of a couple of other um, testing packages. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's an example of how to write uh, a package with a module inside of it um, and test some of the code inside that. Um, and also how to generate the package. So um, yeah, it'll look more or less the same if you're using VS Code. You won't have to use revise by hand, um, but you'll have a REPL and you'll have some files and you can edit those files um, and get live updates. So it should be pretty similar. Okay. Um, any questions about that before we move on? Yes. Right, cool, yeah, good question. So you can do that like this. So if we want to split them up, um, something, I don't know, I'm not feeling creative. Um, so if we want to test these, just this part of the package, for instance. Um, so I've got test slash something.jl. Um, so I could put those tests in there. Um, and in fact, I could even put a test set around them as well. So probably I should call this something more sensible. So if I can uh, call the test set, um, the hello message, and um, I'll, see you, I'll show you in a minute why it's good to add a test set like that. Um, okay, so we'll write those files. And now how do we actually include it? Well, we can do this, um, something. So we can just include that other file from within our run tests. Okay, so let's include the main run tests again. Oh, okay, so something was the matter. I've done something wrong. Oh, because I couldn't spell, yeah, or couldn't type. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Okay, great. Okay, so that's worked. Um, okay, and and I can, I guess, example of why it's good to... Um, to have these test sets is if you break a test, so I've just broken this test here, um, we can uh, have this kind of summary. Now, it might not be super obvious what's going on here, but um, yeah, basically every, every test set will have a line in the summary and there'll be a number of passes and fails for that test set. Um, so yeah, it can give you a pretty good view on what things are passing and failing. Okay, yeah, so there you go. That's how you add those. Any other questions? Above, so before you mean, or? So I could have just had, so this is tests, this file here is is test slash something.jl, just a minute. Um, so I've got, I've got test and then I've got run tests and I've got something.jl inside of there, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So that's what I was doing before. Sorry if it wasn't clear. So I was pressing, um, I was basically doing package.test. So we can go using package. I, I was actually pressing this button. So <laughs> this this um, um, closing square bracket, if you're at the Julia REPL with no, nothing beforehand, and if you press that, you get into package mode. And then you can run uh, the command test and then call package. So that will run that will run the call package tests. And that's exactly equivalent to doing using package and then going package.test. So they're just the same thing, really. Yeah, so there's multiple ways. Um, also, uh, as I was saying, like if you want to split your tests up to make some of them easier to run, you can just include a subset of those. So now we're only just doing the tests for the hello message. Um, yeah, okay, that's enough about that, hopefully. Um, and we will continue. 
Okay, so that was like those three lines <laughs> of the lecture. Okay, so I have a little bit more about to say about testing. Um, we have covered a lot of what I've said here in the notes, um, in the example. Uh, so yeah, it tests go in run tests.jl. Uh, and usually you'd keep those to unit tests, which are tests of like small kind of um, localized pieces of functionality of the code. Um, and that's good because it allows you to um, uh, like figure out what's going wrong pretty quickly. Because if it's testing only one little function or something, you can just go straight to that function and, and when there's a failure. And, um, but you can also include sort of end to end tests where you test the entire package functionality in one go or integration tests where you test how that package integrates with other packages. It sort of depends on the goals for your project. Um, so yeah, like why do we even need testing anyway? Um, so there's like a bunch of different factors. Um, there's some technical factors. So when you have untested code and you make some changes to that code, um, each time you change something, even if you're really careful, there's like some probability of breaking it obviously. Um, and the probability of it being broken if something is not tested just approaches one pretty quickly. So things just get broken and nobody, if there's no test for those, no one's going to notice until that code goes out to someone who's trying to use it. And then that will be broken and everybody will have a bad day. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you have something which is untested and it's um, changes are happening, then things get broken and we call that bit rot. <laughs> um, so like that could include the, the package itself um, changing. Like if you change the code, it can also include environments like other packages changing around it or like systems it integrates with. Um, and that's like even more a true case of like maybe bit rot, which is like you didn't seem to change anything, but everything's broken suddenly. Um, so <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, it's a fun term. Um, so in that case, you would need what integration tests. So you need to check that your thing works with other people's things. Um, so yeah, the, on like the more human side, um, it's good to know if your code is broken right away. Um, so if you're making some changes and you break something and then you commit it and you come back three weeks later and then you try something out and it doesn't work, then the, reason, the exact thing you were doing when you broke it is going to be completely gone from your mind. Um, and it's going to take you hours to get back into the state potentially where you know all the bits and pieces you're doing and you can figure out what's actually broken. <clears throat> so um, it's actually just more fun, honestly, if you have tests. <laughs> um, you feel less to change things and it's, more, it's much easier to fix them when you break them. Um, so even though tests kind of feel like they're a pain to write sometimes, the overall process is more fun if you have them, which is really weird. Yes, question. You just run it, yeah. Run the whole thing, you mean? Or Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um Yeah, and I mean, I guess like on a kind of Capital from from a capitalistic viewpoint, like if you're a company trying to write code, it's way cheaper to have tests which cover it, and rather than discover the broken things later, um, when you have uh, angry customers asking you to fix things. Um, <laughs> okay, so that's like a bit of that. Um, the other thing that can happen if you have like a project with many contributors. So, for instance, the static arrays project, which I was maintainer for for a while, um, one of the maintainers for a couple of years. Um, that project has probably 50 different contributors over the years, um, not all at once, but in, in bits and pieces here and there. And that's a lot of people learning how to change the code. Um, so what tests do in that case is they let someone come in and fix something which is wrong or add something or change the code in some way and not break the existing code. Like so, they the test basically teach some new person how to how to change it without breaking it. So they will like they need to run the tests, and if those tests fail, then they can immediately fix it on their machine. They don't need to ask you a question. They they just like can figure it out. So, um, so like on that side, it's really good for people to learn what's going on with the code. 
um, I would say also that that person can be you. Like you come back to your own project two years later and this happens to me all the time um, and you try and make a change and the things break and the tests teach you, you again how to fix things. So um, if you have code that's going to live for a long time, tests are good. If it's code that's going to live for a week, tests are not so useful. Um, and if you're the maintainer of a project, tests are really good because they let someone else make a contribution and then like me as the maintainer, I can just go, the tests say it's fine and I don't need to look so carefully <laughs> at the change. Okay, so how are we doing for time? We're not too bad. Um, so, okay. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, how do you, so the, try and answer these questions here, like when do you write the tests? How many tests do you write? What flavor of tests do you write? Um, so my personal rule of thumb is if I can't fit the code in my head, if I don't know all the details of every part of the code all at once in my head, roughly, then I need to write tests. <laughs> so it's not that much code. It's like a few hundred lines at max, probably less. Um, and another thing, uh, like you kind of often wonder like how many tests should I write? Or like what kind of tests should I write? So I would say that it depends. Like there's, I would say there's software engineering dogma, which says like, oh yes, you have to write the tests, all the tests at the very start of the project, you have to write, um, you have to like cover all of the code with tests and it has to be perfect. I just don't, I don't buy it. Um, what I would say is that the testing of your project depends on the kind of state of like the, the life cycle of your project. So at the very beginning, you're kind of making all the changes. You're writing a whole pile of new code. Um, all the tests need to keep up with that, all those changes. So what I like to do is to do end-to-end -end tests. So I'll just have a bit of code which runs the whole project and produces an, an output from that and kind of tests whether that kind of worked or not. Um, and I would almost call those smoke tests, like basically that that's another term that's like used in the industry, I guess. <clears throat> smoke tests are like, is anything is on, is, is there some smoke? If so, if something is on fire somewhere. It's like just a quick check. Is there smoke coming out of the system as a whole? <laughs> um, um, so yeah, like I would say end to end tests are probably okay for like small projects or scientific projects where you're doing like, a one-off and you're going to quick, you're going to carefully test the, the system end to end in various ways. Um, but you might not test every little detailed piece of functionality in precise detail. Um, and also those like those let you write, those kind of let you test everything with a small number of tests. Um, but like as your project matures, if you are doing a long-term project, then, um, so like if it's going to live for years, if you get into scientific software development or like commercial software development, um, if the project's going to live for years, then you need high coverage unit tests, basically. So you need to test the little bits of the code and you need to cover all of the code in the sense that every line of the project should probably have a test which runs that line in some way. Um, and there's tools to check whether that's happening. Okay, well, that sounds like kind of a lot of boring stuff, honestly. Next bit is important. You should try and make writing the tests fun. <laughs> Ideally, writing tests should be as fun as playing with your code in the REPL. So we could like write some code in here and play with it. Um, that is basically manual testing. You're just checking whether something works or not. You should aim to make the tests that you're writing as nice and nice to write as that, as fun to play around with as that. It's not always easy, but if you can achieve it, then um, like things will be a lot more fun in software development. Um, so yeah, I've just got some like kind of dot points here about what I think makes testing more fun. So I would say like the test cases should be easy to read and write. So we've seen an example of the test standard library making that nice and easy. So I want to show you this example actually um, at test this thing here. So what I think is interesting about this is um, it's like really obvious what we're trying to test. 
but also we have this operator here. So that's Julia's approx, approx operator. Um, that's actually a fairly fancy little um, floating point testing tool. So if we were to look at this, um, we can see that these aren't actually exactly equal. They're different by the floating point epsilon. And that's pretty expected for tests which are about floating point numbers. You'll have something off by just a little epsilon, the smallest number or some small multiple of that number of, of like the smallest number of floating point difference you can have. Um, and so the approx operator is a really good way of um, uh, just like testing that. It's just a nicety of the test framework. Um, well, of the language, I guess, but um, the fact that it integrates with the test framework is nice. Um, and it just makes the, the test simple to look at. And it also makes, we don't have to do this epsilon testing by hand. We don't have to check, oh, the difference is less than small, some small number. This approx operator knows like what to do already. Um, so yeah, you want successful and, and fail tests to be obvious. So we saw that in the example. Um, we saw that it would show us what the actual problem was. Um, we want to make running the test fast. So it's nothing worse than like, nothing worse than software development than making a change and waiting for like 20 minutes before the compiler tells you or the computer tells you, yes, you would like this makes sense or not. So that's why I'm saying like split your tests into different files if you need to, that kind of thing, because that will help with that. Um, another big one is writing your own test utility code if you need to. So for simple libraries, you don't need to do this, but if you're writing a, um, a big complicated library, um, you might need to write a little bit of test code to help you write the tests for the library. Um, yeah, so those are some, those are some kind of ways to make testing a bit fun. Um, there is an example in Julia Loring, which I probably just don't have time to go through. So I did write a bit of utility code there to just make it really easy for me to write tests. And I personally, I noticed that writing tests for that library went from, oh, this is a pain and I don't really want to do it to like, actually, this is actually pretty fun. And it's my favorite way to test where the library works. It's better than the REPL. So if you can get that to happen, then you like, you'll succeed at writing tests. <laughs> okay. Um, the package development life cycle. So I might just, let's see, what do we want to say here? Um, what I might just show you is an example from today of, um, the workflow involved in maintaining an open source package. Um, so this is just a grab bag of some packages, which I have been involved in, or like the primary author of um, of most of these, but not all of them. Um, <clears throat> we don't have time at all to talk about all of these, um, but there is one Play.io, which uh, I'll show you kind of, let's make that bit bigger. So that's this package here. So this is the GitHub page for this package. Um, so this is a pretty simple little package. It's just for reading and writing a certain file format for geometry files. And um, I guess what I wanted to show you was what might be involved in maintaining an open source package. So, sorry, I've lost which one I was on. Okay, here we go. Okay, so, right. Um, so I went to look at this package today, to be honest, earlier today, because uh, I was going to use it as, as an example. And I saw that someone had made an issue. So it's closed now, but let's have a look at what the issue was. So this was the issue. So an issue is um, if someone finds a problem with your library or if they want a feature or whatever, they can make this issue online and it says uh, what the issue, like they hopefully tell you what the problem is and then you can decide to fix it or not. Like they're not, they're not paying you. You don't have to fix it. But I just saw it and I thought, oh, well, I'll just fix this little problem. So in this case, they, they're saying that like when they read this file format, then uh, there's a certain um, like part of the format which is not preserved in the data structure which I returned. Um, so they wanted that to be fixed. Um, so yeah, I fixed that. 
And so uh, what you would typically do to fix it is you would change the code locally. Uh, then you would, I don't know, I think you've used pull requests, haven't you, in submitting the projects? Yeah, so uh, if it's like a persistent project, like open source project, then it's similar. You make a pull request with your changes. So um, we can go and see the, the changes to, to the package. Um, and I just kind of unilaterally decided to that this was fine and that I did the right thing. But ideally, there would be other people involved in your project, maybe, depending. Um, and they might look at your code and review it. So that would be great. But that's not a luxury we often have in open source. If it's like your own little project, nobody's paying attention. Like you just have to decide what's best for the project. Um, in like a more commercial software development setting, like typically we, people would review each other's code. Okay, so I fixed that um, and I merged it. Uh, also, I would show you this page, which shows that the first. Um, the first time I went to fix this today, this these, this is the automated test system online. Um, so GitHub Actions ran the tests and said, oh, on Julia 1.0, which is ancient at this point, it's like years old, but this package still claims to support Julia 1.0 and the tests check that it does. So basically what had happened was I used a function which was introduced in Julia 1.5 or something and it, there is nothing function. And in 1.0, that's not defined. So there's the tests keeping me honest. Um, in a package which is like eight years old or something. Um, so this package was like, I started this in 0.5, Julia 0.5 or something. So it's ancient um, <laughs> on the scale of things. Okay, so, um, oh, and that's what it would look like. It just says, oh no, your code's not okay. Um, <laughs> here's the VX. Um, so then you go and fix it um, and you get the nice green tick, which says everything passes. Um, yeah. and. Then uh, the one, one last thing I wanted to show about this was that um, the process of releasing such an open source package. So this one is in, in the general registry. So if you use package.add, um, you can add this package. Um, you won't need it for this course. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, to release a new version, um, I just changed this in the project toml to 1.2 and then made this comment here saying at Julia registrator, reg, registrator register. So this is a bot, um, this, this user, and it automatically generates registry pull requests. So we could go there. Um, and this is the pull request to update this package to 1.2. And I think there's like a 20 minute timer and it's all, it's all merged so you can get the new version. So a tiny little taste of how maintaining things might look. Okay. The general registry. Yeah, so yeah, that's basically what's happening there. The Julia Registrator thing is like a bot that makes a pull request automatically to the general registry. Um, there's other ways of making like updates to the general registry, but that's like for me the most straightforward one. Okay, so that is a yes. Yeah, so would there would you get the changes I just made? So if you go um if you go into package mode in the REPL and you did um update, I think it is, um, then yeah, you get the latest versions of all the packages pulled in. Um, but yeah, you have to ask for that to happen because otherwise there's like a pull request to general registry every 10 minutes or something. So like you don't really want to update all the time. <laughs> but yeah, you can definitely easily get those changes. Um, so that person who who like made that issue, which was honestly, it was like a year ago or two. I don't even know. Like I'm not paying much attention to this package, but like they didn't care about fixing it. And so, you know, it's like, oh, well. I just happened to fix it eventually, and now I've made a new version. They can have it if they care. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I think we could talk a little bit about some of this stuff. I'm actually going to skip this last section of the notes about Monte Carlo because I think we have plenty of other things to do, and this is a bit of a like sidetrack. Um, 
but yeah, instead of going into this, we, we could do this, but so maybe at the end of the second lecture, if we have some time, we'll come back to this. Um, what I'd like to do now is just have um, a break slash talk about project two. So um, we'll probably go, I don't know, and for 15 minutes or something, if there's no questions, we can start again sooner, but um, yeah, people can have a break or we can talk about, we can do a combination of that and talk about project two. Okay. So any questions about project two? <laughs> Perfect, yes, no problems. There's time. And do we want the lights on a bit? It's pretty dark in here. Put the back ones on. Uh, no, I'll put it on from here because I think that does something weird. Uh, why are they not on at all though? It's actually kind of weird. Down lights. No. Okay, maybe we do need to press that other button. I don't know. I'm a little bit nervous to press it. I don't know why that didn't did nothing. <laughs> anyway, um, anybody else? Um, does anyone want to talk about the project? How are you going with the project? You do want to? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can definitely come over and have a look at your code. Um, yeah, if there's general questions, we'll do that. You can do that. Do you have a general question, or do you want to talk, look at code? No. Um, did you, is it a GitHub project? Maybe I need to come to your machine and have a look. Okay. So I might just walk around actually for the next 15 minutes or something and we'll have a little look at things. Turn off this.
back on. If people, if anyone's still on chat, we are going to do the second half of the lecture. Um, uh, we're just we're just looking at some project two things for another couple of minutes, maybe. Um, so yeah, there was a question. I might just repeat it if people are still on chat because it was an interesting question. Um, the question was if you have like quantities which are time averages um, of the system, like the average queue length, um, should you expect the difference between that and the theoretical correct value to decrease over time? And the answer is like, yes, you should expect it to decrease, but it could get worse temporarily because it's just a, like it's just a simulation where there's random numbers involved. So yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so is there any more general kind of questions that we could chat about for project two? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. Time for arrival of cells of movement. Um, is that mm -hmm. well, like they walk into the park, they walk back out? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's it's just saying that, like, yeah, I mean, not not really. They didn't walk into the park. They just didn't walk into the park yet. I think that's all it's saying. Like, there's some people out, like, jobs out in the world that just didn't come to the system yet. And, like, that's the thing that happens when they arrive is those things are triggered to come into the system. So, yeah, it's and there's nothing mysterious about it. It's just confusingly worded, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Okay, let's look at chat. Hello, chat. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yes, we are. We are definitely having the second half of the lecture um, in a minute. No questions from chat about project two. Getting anything, that's okay. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes afterwards and um we will we can talk about some specifics if people are having particular problems, but um yeah, maybe we should get into the second lecture, six or seven, yeah. Okay, so Yes, I'm just going to skip this stuff at the bottom because it's it's a little bit of a side quest. Um, and I think we, we'll talk about, we'll jump into um, the next unit. So where is that? I've got it somewhere here. Okay, so unit eight, this is an entirely new thing. Um, I think we have four or maybe five, I think it's four lectures on this stuff. Okay. I think it's this one I want. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started on the second half. Um, so yeah, this is an entirely new thing. So this unit is all about how do you work with real world data basically? Uh, if you like, this will be very applicable to if anyone goes into um, like commercial programming or data analysis kind of stuff or machine learning um, or becomes a data scientist, if you like, um, then yeah, this is very applicable to those kinds of things. Um, and yeah, in particular, we're going to talk about heterogeneous data sets and tabular data or data frames. So uh, there's, yeah, there's like a lot more on this kind of stuff in some other courses. So there's a bit of a list there of other courses which um, talk about these things. Um, but yeah, we're just going to like talk a little bit about it. So hopefully it'll be useful. Okay, um, so the, yeah, the first section, we'll just have a little bit of a chat about relational data and about databases, and then we'll get into some examples. So yeah, databases are like a whole big kind of um, area of their own. Um, 
and there's an and there's an IT course actually on databases, and I think there's other data, there's other courses as well, but there's this INFS course about them. Um, I have used like a bunch of different databases during my professional career. Um, yeah, so basically what they do is is store data in some kind of organized and like organized manner and usually in a way which you can easily query the data. So you can find out information about like you can you can deduce um, sort of answers to your questions about what's in the data quickly from having the data in the database. And it says here not to confuse the term with um, data structures or data frames. Uh, that's fair, although I would say that a data frame, in my opinion, is like a very simple type of database. <laughs> um, generally, a database would be something which is running on a web server or something or a server somewhere that you can connect to, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be a file on your computer. <clears throat> um, yeah, um, and... Many databases are relational databases, and that's what we're kind of going to talk about a bit further down because I think that's it, it's still one of the most um, flexible and powerful ways to look at data. Um, relational databases have been around for quite a long time, actually. Um, there's been like a recent kind of trend. If you ever see like things about NoSQL or non-relational databases, um, there's been a trend for people to use other things other than other than uh, than relational databases, um, but then people realize that actually no relational databases were really good, and mainly you should just use those, except for in some certain cases where you might want to do something else. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know, like that, that's that's one way of looking at it anyway. There's certain cases where it's good to use something else for sure. Um, okay, so. What are relations? What's a relational database? What are relations, though, even? So a relation is actually a concept from mathematics. Um, it's not something that computer scientists dreamt up for their own purposes. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at a function, um, y equals f of x, uh, then we could also consider like that function to be defined by the all the tuples x, y, where in fact all the tuples x, well, this might be a better way of looking at it, all the tuples x and f of x. So that thing there in some sense defines the function. Um, the, the thing that you, yeah. <laughs> the tuples x, y, where y is f, the thing f of x, I guess you could say. Um, but not all, like, so you could think of, okay, sets of tuples, those things can define functions, but you can have tuples, sets of tuples which don't define functions. For instance, we could look at y equals plus or minus the square root of x. So, <clears throat> or you could look at a circle, for instance, um, if you're thinking about a graph, um, of, um, yeah, like a graph in the plane, in the 2D plane, um, that's not really a function because for every given X value, you can have two different possible Y values. Um, but you can still represent it as this set of tuples, X comma Y. Um, so yeah, that's a relation. Um, and functions are a subset of relations. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, you don't have to have just two things in your tuples. You can have multiple things. Um, and so like just like you can have multiple inputs to a function, uh, you could have a big tuple x comma a comma f of a, b, c, or whatever. Like, um, okay, there's a bit more. Yeah, there's like some some other mathematical kind of niceties, I guess, or like interesting bits and pieces that you can have uh, around relations. So you can build up um, Boolean logic using the, the the like trivial case of of tuples of size zero. <laughs> so there can be like for that when the tuples are length are length zero, then there's only uh, there's only two possible relations. There's the empty relation, which is the one without any tuple in it, and there's the one with one single tuple with nothing inside of it, if that makes sense. 
<laughs> so that would be like in Julia, I guess, we have this set, that set there, or we can have this set here. Um, <laughs> so there's only poss two possibilities in that case, and you can you can build up Boolean logic if you want to. Um, but yeah, outside of mathematics, um, so there's like a whole bunch of stuff you could do mathematically with relations, but outside of mathematics, uh, we would we really commonly use relations to model data, and um, we would generally consider only finite sized um, sets. So relation over a tuple ABC, where um, you only have some finite number of tuples. <clears throat> um, so let's like look at an example, I guess, this little tab table here. So if we were looking at the tuple name, comma, birth date, comma, is adult. Um, let's go using data frames, I guess. Oh, oh, this is good. I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong environment. We're not doing that. Let's hope this back. Yeah, this is the right environment. Great. <laughs> okay. Um. So. I think I'm hopefully going to remember the actual. Um, syntax for making one of these things. Okay, so we can make some tabular data like this. Um, so let's make this full example. Um, oh, okay. I, I don't really want to type out all these things. <laughs> Unfortunately, this little example here doesn't come with um, some code to make it. Maybe I won't type all this out. I might just put the is adult example. So basically what you can see here is I'm making this data structure out of its columns. Oops. Okay, so I can make this little table. Um, and what I was, when I'm when talking about the, the tuples which define this relation, we're just talking about the rows of this table here. Um, so in this case, we just have um, a string and a bool in those rows. Um, we could add their birth date, for instance. Um, so if we just looked at the birth date and the is adult um, columns, then presumably it would actually be a function in that case because we would say is adult is uh, is true if the birth date is greater, like the the date between now and their birth date is greater than some number. Um, so that's just a simple function in that case. Um, but if you look at these three things in um, combination as tuple, then you're not, it's not a function anymore. Uh, this name like this name column here is uh, you could have any combination of names and birth dates. You can have the same name um, and the same birth date. You can have the same birth date with different names and you can have the same name with different birth dates. Uh, so it's, it can't possibly be in a function in that case. <clears throat> Um, there's like no one-way mapping that's going on there. Um, okay, so then, yeah, it's very common to have like some kind of uniqueness constraint in one of these tables if you have a database, especially. Um, so example, for example, you might require that the names be um, distinct. Um, that would generally be a bad idea because people can have the same name, um, but you might instead use some unique identifier for the person. So that just like might be an int integer which is incremented when they're added to the system, something like that. Um, and yeah, you would you would use that in, as like a key potentially to look up things within the table. So we could find, go back, ooh, we're gonna see a lot more of this later, but um, in this case, we could find everybody whose name is Alice. Um, and we can get things out of the table with that. And get the table back again with the names which are Alice. This is one way of one syntax for doing that. We'll see a bunch of that kind of thing further down though. But just to try and make this a little bit less abstract and more concrete. Okay. Um, so relational schema. So when you when you're modeling your data, um, 
the schema is really the the set of tables. So in this case, we've got this single this single table here, um, but we could have multiple different tables. We'll see an example in a minute. Um, and the sets of uh, columns that are in each table. So this kind of defines the shape of your data, like what is allowed to exist within your data. Um, and then you would also have potentially relationships between different tables. There's going to be example here. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, right. And then there's a note here about, um, yeah, so like you often also want to achieve in your database um, that the information is only stored in one place. Um, so for instance, if we're looking at this example here <laughs> of a schema, sort of the shape of the data in multiple different tables um, for LinkedIn or a very quasi schema for, for something very, a very simple thing, a bit like LinkedIn, um, we might have a users table and this will have potentially like a unique ID for every user. And then it'll have a first and last name as columns and a summary about, about that person. Um, and what you notice here is that, what you might notice is that, uh, that we don't, we, some things we're not storing in this, in this users table. So we don't store, for instance, the education of the user within in the users table. Now, why might we not do that? Well, because people can have multiple different educations, like they can have different things that they did in their education. So in if we go to look at this education table in the example, um, oh, we're not, this is not zooming in. Okay. We're just going to have to deal with that size. Um, so in the education table, oh, Right, so in the education table down, down the bottom here, can you see the cursor? So it's really small. Um, is uh, um, so for Bill Gates with user ID two five one. There's two different education entries. There's one where he went to school, and there's one where he went to university. And there's probably a pile of those things. Um, so if we were to have a single row in our users table. Um, how are we going to store the education uh, in a single column? So like we have this user, but then there's multiple educations and there could be any number of those. And so it's not convenient. There's not going to be a single entry that we can just have a single column that says education. Um, unless we were to put a list in that column. Um, and that's like not a very efficient way to store the data. Sorry. Right, yeah, we could put a list. And yeah, so this is called normalizing the data as well. You've got like a single place where it's stored and you have, you separate out the kind of, uh, you separate out the way the data is stored so that each table contains, um, yeah, like if you ever have, if you're ever wanting to put multiple things, I guess, in like into a, into a single like, uh, um, into a single cell in some sense in this table, then that's like a sign that you should have a separate table um, in, in your schema. Okay, uh, so I think that was what, uh, this is talking about, yeah, like normalizing your data so that you store like one thing just once and then you have relationships between these tables. Um, so the relationships are um, kind of um, defined by, in this case, the user ID in this in this first unique uh, user ID column for the users is stored as well in these other tables, and then you can join together those um, those relations to make another relation um, with. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see an example. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're just. That's probably all we need to kind of say about that. So just to like, I guess, say what these arrows are about. These are just um, connecting the different tables together based on um, these, these IDs. So yeah, the user ID here going down, connecting to the user ID in these other tables. And that allowing you to pull out like all the educations for Bill Gates, for instance. Okay. So yeah, a standard way to um, interact with that kind of relational data is um, 
actually before I go on, like does anyone have questions about about that stuff? Nope. SQL. Yeah, SQL, SQL, however you would like to pronounce it. Um okay, so no questions. So um oh this should be like that. Oops. Okay, so I'm there's a little bit of about SQL here. Um we're not actually going to use it, but it might be nice just to see. <laughs> you're, you're clapping. It's a nice, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I have used it a fair bit and I don't find it to be too bad, but it's it's definitely its own world. It's like a very different thing from a lot of programming. Um, and actually that's what this is talking about right here. So about declarative programming. So what you do when you use this language to interact with your data is you don't tell it what steps like in Julia, you will tell it, do this step, then do this step, then do this step. It's imperative. You do one thing after another and you tell it what order to do the things in. Um, in. In SQL, you just declare what you want to happen and let the system figure out what order it should happen in. Um, so for instance, I declare that I want these columns from um, the users table. I just want them to, ex I want it to return them. I don't care how it does it, but I want these to come back. Um, so that will that will return those those things from the users table and none of the other columns if there was some. <clears throat> um, if you want to like find only these columns but where there's a particular user, for instance, user ID uh, 251, then you would you would use the same syntax but just add a where clause to the end of that. Uh, and yeah, as I was saying, like there's there's these uh, ID columns or some other kind of keys where you would join different tables together. Um, so if you want to find out, oh, sorry, uh, we we haven't we haven't got to join yet. Oh, in the join, yeah, we do. We, okay, this example has it. Yeah, so for instance, if you wanted to find out all the positions held by a certain person, um, so you could say, okay, we're selecting users user ID and their names and now the organization, we're going to select that. So if we go back and look at our example, um, there was this positions table here, and that has the organization in it because the user could have multiple organizations that they are like employed by or somehow involved in. Um, and that's the case here. Um, we've got user 251 having these two different organizations. Um, so these things are coming from the users table, and this one's coming from the uh, oh, I forgot the name of it the 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 positions table. Okay. Okay, and the way that that's going to happen is we want to only we want to make sure that the user ID in the positions table is the user ID in the users table. Um, so that's what that inner join bit is about. Um, and yeah, we're getting this from the users table as well. And sometimes you might sort of say which table explicitly a column was coming from. Um, sometimes this is necessary because these these uh, these columns are the same have the same name, so they've disambiguated it with it's coming from the users column. Um, okay, and then it's sort of saying, oh well, um, if you sort of if you were linked in, for instance, and you did this query, then your databases would be very unhappy because there's millions of users. Um, so if, say, you didn't want to crash your database server um, or just like in practice get rejected from, get the query rejected for being too slow, um, provided the database people have done like a good job of setting the database up, um, then yeah, you'd probably want to restrict it to something. So then you can use the where clause to say, actually, I just want user 251 or you might say, oh, I actually want the user with first name of such and such and last name of such and such. And then that would potentially return multiple um, multiple different people, but with the same name. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's generally like that kind of thing is a lot better in practice because you don't need to send a pile of data over the network. Um, yeah, so that is all we are going to say about SQL. <laughs> And some people are very happy. <laughs>
<laughs> I like SQL actually. <laughs> if you happen to be stuck using SQL, by the way, you can go using, I won't do it there. You can go using SQL strings. Uh, you can, what is it? Um, 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 this package SQL REPL or SQL REPL, um, this allows you to use the Julia REPL to ask questions of a SQL database and also get your data back in data frames and then you can process it in your Julia REPL. So um, if you like that kind of thing, you could use that package and that's a package I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to be a package I wrote. Anyway, uh, well, we could see if it will... Anyway, it's not going to help us because we don't have a database to talk to. So even though this will add, add SQL REPL, we, we can't actually play with it. Um, but I'm so happy to show anybody if you're interested later, another time. We don't even need to seal that. We're back to previous lecture where it's compiling the whole time. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, yeah, that's all we're going to be talking about though in the lectures. So, but what we are mainly going to be talking about is uh, the data frames package. Now this is very useful and what this lets you work with is a single table at a time. So this is what we've got over in this REPL over here. We've got this thing, df, which is our data frame, and it's a little table. Um, so what I'm going to do is load, oh, I'll do that in a minute. Um, what time is it? Oh, yeah, we've, we, we'll open this one up. Um, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll do that in a minute. So what we're going to actually load some data from file in a minute. Um, okay, so what's, what is a data frame? Uh, it's just a representation of a table, um, and the table has, uh, it has named columns, so you can see here. For instance, in this case, we have these columns, and they each have a name. <clears throat> the columns also have a type associated with them, so this is of type string, the second one's of type bool. And yeah, you can have anything you like in these columns. Okay, so it's heterogeneous data. And you can even put in, um, <clears throat> you could put arrays into those columns if you want to. You can do what you like. Um, okay, and so there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there is a data set which is available in the course um, notes, in with the course notes. Uh, is is it this one athlete events I think yeah athlete events in the data directory there's this CSV file and that's containing um, a moderate sized data set from Kaggle Kaggle's a, a website which has uh, uh, competitions for machine learning on it so if you want to like a company will say I want this machine learning task done and they put it on Kaggle and then people compete to try and make the best machine learning thing they can do from the data that people have put there so there's a whole bunch of data sets on there if you want to go and fiddle with them. And in this case, we're going to look at the athlete events CSV. Um, and that has uh, all athletes who've participated in the summer or winter Olympics um, for a whole pile of years. And it's around 40 megabytes and has 27,000 rows. So it's pretty small um, for like a modern machine. <clears throat> um, but yeah, that would have been considered big <laughs> years ago. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, and so like in contrast to what people would call big data, that's that's small data. I would say big data is like you can't process it unless you have a whole cluster of machines. So that's a kind of good rule of thumb. Uh, Okay, and so we have this CSV file, so we're going to op that, open that up. Uh, I think that's all this is saying here. All right, and so just to note as well that <clears throat> um, it doesn't really matter which one of the sort of scientific programming language kind of systems you're using. There'll be something like dataframes.jl, but it'll be called something else. So in Python, Pandas is the standard uh, thing to use for this. In R, there's a bunch of different packages um, as well. I, I don't know them well, though, at all. Um, it says that the built-in data frames are common. Yeah. OK, so let's actually look at the data. So what's in this thing? So we can go open. 
open the athlete events.csv. So this little chunk of code is just going to print out the first few lines of that. Um, so yeah, the first line has just got the column names. Um, so we've got a bunch of things about the athletes. And notably, like we can have the athlete multiple times in this data set because this is like they could have gone to multiple different events. So they could be in, in here multiple times. So this data is not normalized. Their, their names will occur multiple times, for instance. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, so does anybody know what this syntax is about? I think we might have talked about it before. Silence going on. <laughs> okay, to explain what's going on here. <clears throat> the open function, sorry, go on. A pipeline. Um, no, although we will get to those. Um, the do syntax is just about making this thing here, this whole thing here becomes an anonymous function, which gets passed as the first argument to open. So what this allows us to do is, and the IO thing is the thing that you get, this is the input output object that you get when you open a file. Um, but what open will do is it runs the user function, which is just this stuff with printing some lines, and then it automatically closes the file afterwards. So the reason that's nice to use this form of open um, is that we don't need to call close later. We don't end up with a pile of open hand, um, file handles. But yeah, like we could even do, we could do this thing though. We could do this instead. Um, so we could get an IO stream and then we could run this same code like this and it does the same thing. And then we would go close IO um, and that achieves the same basic thing, um, but we had to call close manually in that case. Okay, so that's what that do syntax is about. Um... <clears throat> Okay, um, so yeah, we're going to need the data frames and CSV file, um, the CSV packages, sorry, um, for this example. And csv.file lets us, oh, we can't see everything that's going on there. There we go. Oh, okay. So yeah, csv.file lets us just really easily read a, um, CSV files. One of the issues with CSV files is that they come in lots of um, different subtly incompatible formats. <clears throat> um, for instance, in this particular data set, when something is missing from the data set, so like for instance, the athlete's name could be missing. Actually, that's probably not one that would be missing, but like more likely it's like the, the city was not known or maybe the 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 like... Um, I don't even know what that column is. <laughs> Maybe the height of the athlete wasn't known, for instance, um, in which case an NA can be in that cell of this, this table. Um, but what we want to do is map, map, map that into the missing value in Julia. So missing is just something like nothing, <laughs> subtly different. Um, which, yeah, we can use as a placeholder for when there's no data available. Okay, so let's run this little code here. <clears throat> so uh, we also have, so we have this thing DF now and it's been overwritten. Um, oh, oh yeah, okay, good. You can see that up there. So uh, yeah, so this is the content of the data frame and it's telling us that it's, tw uh, it's 271 um, thousand rows of information in here. And this is just printing like a summary of the first few, like first and last rows, which are in this data. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you would like to make the summary yourself, that's fine. We can do that with the first. So yeah, we'll just show you a grab bag of a few different things you can do with these, so. So like we could get the first 10 rows, rows of that thing or the last 10, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we can see some kind of examples of what's in there. 
this is just more we can we can get the last um <clears throat> yeah so in this case uh they claim the notes claim which i haven't looked at that it's sorted by the last name um which it does um, that that doesn't look entirely true <laughs> i'm not sure what that's about there um they haven't split this out either into first and last names um but yeah anyway um, but yeah, there's an ID column as well, which identifies the athletes. So you, for instance, you can see here that this athlete is in here multiple times um, and their ID is the same each time. So if we want to, sorry, what's that? The age is, age oh, the age changes. Yeah, so actually each of these rows is a, um, like an event that they did. So it makes sense that the age will be different in different rows. Um, yeah, and you can also see that there's these missing, these missing values. So this case, um, in this case, the height and weight of this athlete was not known, um, which might make sense. Like if the like event was a long time ago or it wasn't relevant to the sport. Um, if we go back and look at uh, the raw data that was in the file, you can also see that NA was in the file for things which were missing, but again, that's been mapped into missing in Julia. Um, and that just allows us to manipulate things instead of just using strings uh, for sort of, and, and then like, for instance, we'd have that the height would be a, a mixture of integers and strings, which is pretty weird. Whereas in this case, it's a mixture of missings and, and integers. So it just provides like a nice marker uh, for working with any data which is missing. <clears throat> um, yeah, so you can also think of, oh, you can think of this data frame as a two-dimensional table as well. So in that case, you can think about indexing it like a matrix, and that's what we're doing here. So we're saying the first 10 rows and all of the columns. So we could do that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, I don't actually know if this works, but you potentially can take multiple columns by index. Yeah, there you go. So we could index the columns by their position rather than their names. We can also look at the, uh, the columns individually. So if we want to look at the name, for instance, we could look just at the name using df.name and that pulls out the entire set of names as a vector. Okay. <clears throat> yep, so that's what this is talking about here. So we can use this property syntax to get at the individual uh, named columns, um, their height. Okay, so, <clears throat> so now we're going to get to our first example of actually doing something a little bit less trivial with this data. Um, and this is like a very typical thing that you might want to do with data like this. You might want to ask, well, how bad is the data? How much stuff is missing from the data? So here's an example. If you want to look at the heights and you want to look at the heights which are missing, so remember this dot syntax here means map this function is missing. Do this thing on the left, this function is missing to every single value inside of here. Um, so that broadcasting syntax means that. So we can look at that. And you'll see that there's some some things where some entries where it's true, it's actually missing. So we can count those. So that just means add up all the things which are where that's true. Um, so we've got 60,000 cases of where we just don't have any height <clears throat> data for the athlete for that event. Um, Okay, how many unique athletes are there? So there's a function unique, which is um, a standard Julia function. And you, it will take any vector and just return a vector of everything which is unique in that, in that vector. So we can do the length of that. And we've got that number. Now this, I did this on purpose and it's different from what the notes are, but 
um, we're going to go do the notes version as well. So what does it, oh, okay. And I need to emphasize as well that this little triangle, which is appearing in my REPL, is just these two characters. That's all it is. Um, it's just a fancy font, which puts them together. So don't worry too much about it. It's just these two characters. <laughs> Sorry about that if it's confusing. Um, right, so if we want to look at, now this, this is data piping syntax. That's what this pipe thing here is about. Um, what this means is do this function on the right-hand side to the thing on the left-hand side. And that might seem kind of like a weird thing to do, but it turns out to be like really useful in data processing scenarios where you kind of, um, first you do one thing to the data, then you do another thing and you keep doing a few things. And usually you're trying to do something, uh, you're trying to apply some function on the end of all of the other things that you've done to the data. So it can be quite useful to arrange it in this big pipeline of processing steps with these arrows in between or these pipe operators. So in this, this case, we could do length. So, but let's look at another way of writing that and it, you might see why it's a little bit more interesting. So we sort of do one processing step, which is to find the unique things. And that, that's one thing. But then next we want to do um, the length of those unique things. So that's why it's kind of nice. You just have this sequence of things. And I would normally arrange it so that something like this, formatted something like this, so that the data, you can see the data is kind of flowing through the system as you, you do all of the operations to it. Okay. Um, there's also a there's also a unique function which is defined on data frames, and that's specifically useful. That's defined by the data frames package, <clears throat> and that's specifically useful to find like a new data frame, but which is unique on a particular column. So, um, it will just take the first uh, the first. Uh, row which has a certain value of ID and then all of the times that ID turns up with that same value again it'll just ignore those rows so that's what we're going to get from this one yeah so how long is that so this tells us how many oh oh that's force this is this is not defined still not defined it's 2024 and length is not defined for data frame. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a wrong, 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 wrong index. It's the number of columns. <clears throat> yeah, so there's 135,000 uh, unique athletes in this data set. Okay. Right, so we are kind of about to wrap up. I'm almost, I think what I'm going to do is leave it for there, leave it for now. Um, and we'll come back to the analysis because it's kind of a good stopping point. Um, we'll come back to the analysis next week. And for this week, we can just continue talking about any project stuff um, for a few minutes. So yeah, I might just leave it there for now. Okay. And this time, let's try and remember to stop Zoom. <laughs> Unless anyone on chat has some question they would like, a general question that they'd like answered about the project, if I can answer anything before we stop soon, then I'm happy to. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm just going to close Zoom and talk to people who are in the room. Okay, I will see you later. Bye, chat. <laughs>